What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of Culture FC, the weekly soccer show that's not really about soccer. We cover all culturally relevant aspects of the game, just none of the results on it. I'm Louis. I'm Alan. I'm Brandon. And today's episode's pretty cool. Because of the USSF's, the United States Soccer Federation's presidential election that's taking place tomorrow, we decided to take a look at the main topics that these different candidates have used as the, the pillars of their campaigns. So in other words, what are the four main topics that everyone's talking about when they're talking about their vision for U.S. soccer and how they're going to better U.S. soccer as a whole? Those four issues are promotion relegation, the youth development and pay to play system that we have in the country, the, the women's national team, as well as the NWSL and women's equality within the game. And lastly, the transparency and the role of the United States Soccer Federation. We went through a couple of the different uh, candidates' ideas on each of these topics, but as well as our own views, and we kind of rolled through it that way. So as always, if you like our podcast, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, as well as give us that five-star review on your podcast app. We appreciate it, and we thank you. So let's get right into the show. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode. So let's kick it off. Get right back. Get right back into things. We're gonna be bringing back this five quick bits a little segment that we started last podcast, and I'm gonna be dishing out some five quick bits for Louis and Brennan to kind of give some quick feedback on. So number one, kick it out. Um, an, a, an organization that aims to kick racism and discrimination out of fo- football has reported that um, in the first half of the English season this year, or in in world soccer, English soccer discrimination has gone up a crazy 60%. It's gone up 60%? Up 60%. Jeez. Wow. Yeah, and the Premier League accounted for 64 out of 282 incidents um, of reported abuse. Interestingly enough, a lot of these incidents occurred via t- Twitter. Twitter. Huh. And English, right? It's, it's yeah, the English Premier League. Yeah, and this, huh. this accounts for um, players... People associated to clubs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Do we think it has anything to do with the current political climate in England? With well, Brexit that's a big, stuff? that's a big issue, and they think that that is kind of charged that it's a little bit more. Allowing people to right, kind of a come lot, into a lot the of light. this anti, anti, hate or hate community has prospered. I'll be honest with you. I, I never really thought of England as like, at least not modernly, like very racist or blatantly racist, like. I mean, it's not like us in America where, you know, as a general whole, you could probably say we're one of the most racist countries, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, but I never really considered England to be no, that racist. me neither. I think um, I would have put, like, something like Italy or something, because I know like Italy Russia. or Russia even. But, like, yeah, I feel like Italy has always had some kind of systemic racism towards... Um, black players, yeah. At least. Oh, yeah, especially on on the field. I, I just, it's like when, when I try to clear it up. What I to clear what I said, it's like you don't really see like blatant acts of racism on the f- like pitch and stuff in England versus like where you will see it in Spain or you will see it in um, Russia and things like that. Like right. those players throwing the banana yeah. at, at yeah. certain black players in Russia. Like that's yeah, that happens pulsing. a lot in Russia and Italy. So uh, yeah, I I think it's definitely something that is counter productive to what we've seen over the years happening of yeah. kind of this trend going down but i mean it is what it is hopefully kick it out can do a little better of kicking it kicking out kicking it out yeah um but yeah all right second topic quickly nikely released the new mercurial Sur- superfly 360s and more interestingly enough because they always release the cleats every year but they released the new mercurial touch elite gloves which are the new soccer um goalie gloves they came out, and for anyone that hasn't seen them, they're a complete re-engineering of what goalie gloves are. They got rid of the wrist straps. They made them a more silhouette that went down a little bit more, a little bit further on the wrists. Um, B, you're, you're a goalie. What are your thoughts? Um, I always had trouble getting gloves on without straps. Even ones with the straps, like sometimes they wouldn't open far enough yep. that I could fit my wrist into. So hopefully they took like a really hard step to eliminate that discomfort um 
I've seen the pictures of them. They look somewhat similar to scuba diving gloves. They li- just look a little bulky, a little cumbersome. They're although very futuristic. They, yeah, they do look like su- like scuba diving. Yeah, gloves. they look like you could do more than just play soccer in them. Yeah. Um, they look like all-weather gloves. Yeah. But I'm excited to see, hopefully to try on them. Uh, I've always wanted to see what a re-engineered goalie glove could be because yeah. I've never really thought of a goalie glove that needed to be re-engineered. Right. I always thought, like, par for the course, this is a goalie right. glove. I'm trying to keep my fingers fingers safe. So one thing I brought up the other day was the fact that um, it looks like there's no, like, finger saves on them. But yeah. then my uh, good pal over here, Alan, said that a lot of pros don't really use them. So that kind of clears that up. I read online somewhere that someone someone quoted them in a – in an article, they said that it looks like something you do gardening with on Mars. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that oh, that was yeah, just like very true. wicked funny. Um, but I think it's cool. For how long have goalie gloves been around? And yeah, they, they seem no like they've just been the same forever since um, I can remember they've seen Oh, the yeah. Same. And so one thing that I read also was that they were looking at all these different sports kind of gloves. And one thing we were speaking about a little bit before is the fact that American football gloves for receivers, they are so sticky. Yeah. And it's like... If you, anybody on this podcast watches American football occasionally or has seen it, some of these insane catches that these players make, like jumping in the air, bending back halfway, and they still manage to hold the ball in like, the palm of their hand. Uh, Odell Beckham, we're talking to yeah, you. Oh, yeah, Odell <laughs> Beckham, if, if you need an example. And, you know, I think it's cool to be if they added some of that technology into these goalie gloves because everyone's like it. At least for me, I've seen some goalie gloves that it just they don't seem that grippy to me. They yeah. just seem they like just seem like padding. Yeah, they seem like padding, but they don't seem like they're gonna hold the ball in place necessarily. So if they did add some of that to this one, I think yeah, kudos, and I'd love to see them in person. Yeah, definitely. And point number three: former uh, France defender, Manchester United uh, defender, Legend. Patrice <clears throat> Evra has joined West Ham on a short term short short. Wow, I can't speak today. Short term deal. This is interesting because, sure, players get signed and what whatnot, but Ever actually got released from his old or his prior club because of an incident where he actually kicked a fan in the chest. <laughs> um, and this kind of goes back to the whole the first topic of kick it out. the The actual incident, what was said from the fan, wasn't um, released to the public, but allegedly there was some racist connotations there. Ever kicks the fan gets fired so it's kind of good to see him back playing football. i thought he was banned from football i yeah i don't know i just seems that i just i think i think he got maybe from french football because oh, it wasn't because i guess they can't really ban, ban him, him from, from everything from, yeah i mean he might have been banned for a little bit i mean when cantona did it he got banned for what six months oh uh, no play. it was a lot longer than that really? like a, a year, year or something uh, but that was from the fa like the right the, the british right. FA was so like no was, you're not allowed the french to. it was the french league and yeah. i've just been seeing videos of him in dubai kind of doing weird things being a crazy man so <laughs> he's he's amazing on social media yeah his he's, social media game is so awful. funny he just seems like a like a lunatic honestly oh, yeah. but he was a, a fun guy but have either of you ever been pushed to the point where you've wanted to kick, kick a fan someone? well no i also think it's different i mean oh yeah i've played with i've played with parents who i i would want to kick in the face because they just yell on the sideline so much at like a specific person oh yeah oh yeah i've, I've experienced that but we'll move on from that Fourth topic, DeAndre Yedlin believes that soccer talent is slipping through the net in the U.S. He believes that we should be looking more into unconventional locations to find players and does not believe that that's currently being done. I 100% agree with him. Yeah. I don't really need to go too much in depth with it, but 100% makes perfect sense. Yeah. I mean, you considered, I mean, the YouTube age of today, kids can learn how to dance in the span of 12 (laughs) months and become uh, phenomenal dancers. You've seen these transformation videos. So what's the difference with soccer? I'm sure there are kids that play out in the sticks of, like, Alabama or anything that are fantastic soccer players, just don't have the opportunities that some of these other kids in metropolitan areas may have. So I think, yeah, we definitely need to start scouting more rural, more different ways of, of looking i mean even like looking through kids and their like youtube videos yeah. like who's to say we can't find someone who's going to be phenomenal and like also have the media presence you know yeah which would no, be cool. i agree and i think that that's going to play very well into the today's discussion that we'll be getting into after this next point and that is p- 
pardon if I can't pronounce his name correctly because it's probably the second time I've ever said this out loud, but Locomotive Moscow, a football team out of Russia, passed on a chance to sign a 16-year-old Neymar for 10 million euro in 2008. They stated that the transfer package was a little too costly for them. <laughs> and <laughs> instead of Neymar, they stuck with their own youth player who they believed was going to be the exact same level as him, a man named Alan, what a wonderful name, Alan Gatagov. Never heard of him. Exactly. My two points on this. Thank God they didn't sign him. <laughs> and they're a bunch of morons. Because right before this podcast, we started recording. Got a notification on my phone saying that Neymar has more than doubled uh, PSG's jersey sales. <laughs> he is accounting solely for the um, all of the money they've made probably in the last year. Yeah. So... Um, Thank you for they, not doing it because I don't think he would have. I will become, say this: they admitted to saying it was a bad financial decision. On their yeah. Part. yeah. Oh shit. So. Do you think he would have like plateaued in Russia though? Yes, like, I don't think he would have been the player he is today if he was stuck in that cold, that cold, would, imagine, cold, dude, cold Moscow. Welcome to Russia. Your career's ended. Yeah, I mean, you have never. I mean, a couple of players have gone to Russia, and their careers have been fine. Um, one I can think of is William from from Chelsea. Played at Anzi Mekachakalaka, and he <laughs> still ended up at Chelsea, still ended up, you know, doing True. his thing. But for the most part, Russia isn't really where Brazilian players tend to shine. Right. Yeah. Which, Woulda, you know, coulda, shoulda. Yeah. Well, there's lots of stories like this that people yeah. are like, yeah, I could have signed Neymar. So I also want to say, it's funny is it that true? they came out. No, they came out and said it. Like, yeah. they were like, yeah, we had the, like, where our scouts had been to Santos' base, had done a bunch of it, but then presented it to, the, they were just like, I don't think this is a valuable <laughs> thing for us. It's like, yeah. but we wanted Neymar, so you guys can always buy our so, club's jerseys. And Alan Gatigoff, that was the name. It's like, what I don't get, sorry to keep going off topic, but it's people to this day going, God, Neymar's overrated. Shut up. Neymar is, is easily the second best player in the world right now, potentially the best player in the world. Like, yeah. what do you, what yeah. do you mean he's overrated? I agree. I agree. I think, yeah. Yeah, within the next five years, he's probably going to blossom into something. Well, think about it. Cristiano Ronaldo I is not right. playing well this year. No. Real Madrid is doing booty, and Cristiano Ronaldo himself is not playing well. Messi's still playing fine, you know what I mean? But Neymar is the only other one who's relatively close to Messi at all. Um... So yeah, although our right. Egyptian king, <laughs> that's <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a topic for another day. But all right, let's get into it. Today's topics: we're going to be covering some of the presidential candidates for the United States Soccer Federation um, election that's going to be happening this coming weekend. We're going to be covering a lot of a lot of the four main general topics that are kind of being discussed amongst these presidents and what their opinions are. Those four topics are pay-to-play, U.S. development, the promotion relegation, women's national team, and kind of NWSL equality, and then the transparency and role of the USSF president. The eight candidates that are currently running are Kyle Martino. You might know him if you watch NBC. He's a former pro, former pro, played at all levels of professional soccer. Um, Carlos Cordedo, he's a former Goldman Sachs executive. He's the current president, Gulati's right-hand man and current vice president of the uh, federation. Steve Gans, who's a Boston attorney challenging for presidency, he announced his um, candidacy, I think, back in 20, early 2017. Mike Winograd, he's a, one of the country's leading corporate lawyers. Paul Cag- Caliguri, a former... Um, USM <laughs> men's <laughs> players. Sorry, my brain is so scattered this morning. Um, who scored the winning goal to actually get the U.S. into the 1990 World Cup. He said in late November he hadn't actually filed any of the paperwork for that yet, though, so that's kind of a bad sign, but his name's there in the running. Hope Solo. You know Hope Solo if you've ever watched U.S. women's soccer. Which you should, because they are a lot better than the men. Absolutely. <laughs> you've also, if you don't know her from that, you probably know her from... One of her very scandals. We won't get too much into that, but famous both on and off the pitch. Kathy Carter, who is, I think right now, a, a front runner because she is one of the people who is most closely tied to the organization right now. She's a former CEO of Soccer United Marketing. And yeah, she's, she's probably one of the front runners for, the, for candidacy. And then we have Eric Winalda, another personality that you might know. He, he, curr- he was a personality for Fox Soccer before he started running his 
candidacy and also a former pro. So kind of diving into it, we're going to be talking about some of these candidates' views and opinions on, on these main topics. The first one today that we're going to be discussing is promotion relegation, which I think is one of the biggest topics that these candidates have had to go through. And before we kind of get into it, I want to get your views on promotion relegation quickly. Uh, I think it's absolutely necessary for the U.S. to implement promotion relegation, especially because of, of, you know, if you followed our podcast, you've seen we've talked a little bit about some of the lower level teams that we've kind of highlighted. Um, And because there's so many of these teams coming out and putting such an awesome product out on the field and devoting so much time to building this love and this base for these second, third, fourth division teams, they need the opportunity to really become this high level first division team through a system. And right now there is no system that's going to get Detroit City Football Club into the MLS, especially because the MLS is basically like this elitist club. And that's how they're trying to portray it. Like, no, no, no. Only the few that we accept and allow are in. And there's no real hope of, of allowing a lower lower division team to get up to the top. There's no Cinderella story, you know. Right. And so I think that, and also for competition, you just need to have promotion relegation. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. my biggest point, I think, is the competition that promotion relegation brings. Um, there's gonna, be, I mean, kids in up, up in England. I mean, there's there wouldn't be any Jamie Vardy's. There wouldn't be a Leicester City story if they didn't right. have promotion relegation. So I think that's the most important thing to kind of keep competitive play in the highest level. Competitive is to have promotion relegation, right. and yeah, I think it also allows for the everyday person who wants to play soccer and like really try hard at it has the potential to maybe one day make it in the MLS. Yeah, so the reason why this is even a topic, uh, the MLS doesn't have promotion relegation, obviously, but uh, current president Sunil Gulati doesn't actually think that pro- promotion relegation would work in the United States because of the current structure that the MLS is under. And people, even though so many fans have argued against that and said, no, th- this isn't what we want. We want promotion relegation. He still seems to, to have various points, points that kind of don't make sense. He even goes out in an article to say that um, an organization, Deloitte, came out with uh, research on it saying that, yes, this would help kind of distribute the powers more evenly throughout the United States soccer. He's like, no. I, we, we, as he said he spoke to the, to the person who did the research and they came to a conclusion that that's not true. So... <laughs> Uh, people that Hope Solo, Eric Ronaldo, Kyle Martina are kind of all in for it, the promotion relegation. Some people who are against it are, are that have had some tricky kind of points of view on it. Uh, Mike Winograd, he actually makes a point that I, I sort of believe in, but, but also think that um, not really. So he makes the argument that there needs to first, before jumping into this, into this promotion relegation, there needs to be a bridge in the quality between divisions. So what do you think about that? I think that you're not going to really have the... It's a double-edged sword. Without promotion and relegation instituted, the lower division teams will never really become better because they have nothing to strive for. They're just... The MLS just ends up pawning off of... Pawning off... Taking all of the best players from Nassau, from USL Pro. And so none of these second, third, or fourth division teams are ever going to get good enough to get to the point where they're going to be able to bridge that gap. Sure, it could be a volume kind of thing where eventually so many people are playing the game at an amateur, not amateur, a lower professional level that just by sheer volume alone, it'll bridge the gap. But that's a long-term view, and that's really, really, it's just not the answer in my opinion. Yeah, Yeah, um, I also think that with the people kind of just snatching and grabbing all like the best players from these lower divisions, it, it completely takes away any kind of, competition or any kind of uh room for growth in within the division because these kids are just gonna be oh i'm the best in nassau like right. i'm just gonna go play mls why why right. do i why do i want to be the best in nassau if i can just go right. play for this mls prestigious right. league um so. one of the other candidates kathy carter she's kind of on the same boat and she she thinks that there needs to be sus- sustainability in all the leagues before that before this jump can be made which is kind of a safe answer because you can just say, oh, we won't do it until everyone is safe. Right. So my, my view on this is, is like this. <clears throat> you have right now leagues that are pretty different in terms of quality, but 
you implement promotion relegation and within the next five to ten years there's a much better distribution of talent. Of course. That's just survival of the fittest, right? You're going to go up to the first division. You might lose every single game, but you'll have enough money to potentially buy players to compete, et cetera. And throughout time, you're going to see clubs, different clubs moving in and out, getting money, being able to support themselves, being able to support paying that one star that will carry them to survival in the league or what it may be exactly like, like the Leicester story like any story that you see in the Premier League where a team is just happy to survive and then now all of a sudden they are uh, well, Southampton is a team that I can think Burnley of. if you think about right. it Burnley is a recently promoted club and they're currently fighting for 6th, 5th you know what right. I mean so, so it's pretty it, it's something it's an argument that's pretty poor I mean if you just look at the way that nature is like you're going to be fighting to survive and because of that you're going to be using the money to invest into your club right. because yes there are financial benefits to it but you need to make sure that for you to actually gain from the financial benefits you need to survive in that in that primary right. league and i feel as if they don't want to make this long-term commitment to see that out because they want to see well, of course not instant right. instant change and they want to just make it the best they can make it but they don't want to make this well, investment we, and i will say you say like the mls yeah well no the mls is just protecting their owners pockets exactly like we've right. spoken about a little bit on this podcast before the owners pay so much money to get these teams into the league they would never accept relegation bec- because they're like wait i just invested all this money in 150 million which is like currently the the price tag to have a franchise on top of a stadium deal on top of a training center and for American owners, they find it blasphemous that there's even a possi- remote possibility that their team will get relegated. Uh, because for them, it's like, why would I invest in this league if I have the potential of losing my money? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that that is, it's not the league's job to be catering to the owners. Uh, I think that they should be catering to the sport and catering to the players. And so uh, for me, I don't think it should matter what the owners necessarily all collectively want in terms of security necessarily which i understand like when they invested in the club they didn't promotion relegation wasn't even on the like a topic at the time right. but you know i can sort of see that and i can you need to evolve with the times you have to evolve with the times yeah especially if that's what your consumer base is calling for of course if you're gonna ignore what the consumer base is asking for you're kind of just separating the club. you're gonna alienate your, right some of your fans but uh, so one good point that's Sunil Gulati kind of makes that I that I somewhat agree with right now is that the current structure where you have a it's not like the rest of the world where investors can just invest a shit ton of money into the into the, their team and have it flourish and do whatever. There's a cap in the MLS. Do you think that that needs to be removed for this promotion allegation to succeed and for that the, the distribution of wealth to to succeed, or do you think that can still happen with the um, cap that teams have for the amount of money that can be put in. So I think that all the crazy MLS rules were well put in place with good intentions for the beginning of the league because, you know, they had they didn't have much success with leagues prior to the MLS. And for a really long time, the MLS was close to crashing. And some people will say that it took David Beckham arriving in the MLS to f- truly solidify MLS's standing. But times have changed. These rules need to be removed. Because it's not 1998, it's not 2001, it's not 2003. We so are, are you saying that you don't think it'll succeed with the current structure if, if there were... Oh, I think, it'll, I think it'll succeed regardless. I think that these rules of cap space and um, these little provisions that kind of protect the club from folding, I think they're very intelligent, but maybe they should be moved down divisions. Let's maybe get rid of that cap for the MLS. Or actually, then that would just create a bigger inequality issue. I think that maybe either removing it completely or applying it to the clubs below. And then I don't think it's going to change promotion relegation. I think that the reason they did it is so that the club, the, the league wouldn't fold and the clubs wouldn't fold. Great. That's honorable. A lot of lower league teams are having the same issue. Uh, so I just think that with promotion relegation, even with these caps, things will succeed. Yeah. I think at, uh, to counter Kathy's point about making sure the leagues are sustainable, I actually th- and this is not a financially backed idea, but from my very kind of small understanding, I would think that if you opened up promotion relegation and say the Seattle Sounders collapse and go into the second division, their very loyal fan base would still go to all the games. That would help traveling teams get more support. That would help all of these leagues. I mean, it would help all of these smaller teams kind of compete with these 
higher quality, better quality teams would introduce a bigger culture of fan support. A lot of these USL teams and national teams, they have a lot of support, but it would introduce that kind of MLS type of feel to their fan, to the fan bases and would only help those, those lower leagues even more. Right. So I'm not sure that her point to making sure that these leagues are sustainable um, is actually a counter argument against right. relegation. One point that I oh sorry, but you I say get rid of the cap. I say get rid of it. Yeah. Let anyone who wants to come in and just in like like look at Man City and look at PSG, like the money that is put into these clubs. Yeah. Yeah, it's gonna create a diff like a, a definite gap, but I think that'll only allow for more people to watch. And yeah. Like, oh wow, there's like a team that just had like three fifty mil injected into yeah. them. Like, we gotta watch this now. Right. That's my. That's what I want to see. Yeah. I'm all about just. I mean, yeah, I don't want to see oil money go into it, but I I would love to just see one team just strapped with cash stack, and just like just start team. flowing but money. But I will say that's all. That's it's that's an it's an awesome short term solution because short term everyone will start paying attention. Problem is, in the long term, it might stagnate. It, it would it would just create a situation where you have two or three superpower clubs in the MLS, and everyone else is just. But do you not. think that's the case with the Premier League? Yeah, you I think do. so. What are the power, What are the two power clubs? Not two, but there's a group. There's a select group of about five clubs that are always at the top. Yeah, you know, but I'd say that Lester that's a good number. Mold, but and that's here's the question. It comes down to capitalism versus socialism. If you if you think about that, if you think of MLS as a socialist kind of of yeah. of, I know Americans hate hearing that <laughs> word, but that's the true <laughs> meaning of it. They, that's what they, all American sports are. Yeah, socialist. American social. Um, the MLS is very socialist versus American economy is very capitalist. Yeah. But when every other league in the world is very capitalist, it's very bootstrap. It's very you. The better you do, the better you know you'll get rewarded for how well you do. Um, I think that's kind of the, the, the main point in terms of that. I would say, I think we're, I think that if we're looking at a lot of the leagues in the world, that is true because Spain, that's the case. Germany, that's the case. But the Premier League has shown that it kind of breaks the mold because I don't actually think that having five or six teams makes it an elitist group because even now Arsenal, who's strapped <laughs> with cash, is fighting with Burnley for six positions. Right, right, it comes down to it where it's like, the merit is there if you put the work in. Yeah. Right. I, I, absolutely. And I think it just comes down to how well you are run as a club and how well you're investing the money. So yeah. I, I think that, yeah, I mean, I, I like the idea of, of market, uh, of having a cap on teams, but... At least to... It, it's just... It, but the reason they put it in was just to make sure that no one folded. Right. Once you're past that stage where you're flourishing, no point in putting the cap. Yeah. Because you're just, you're just limiting your league. Like you said, B, it'd be nice Letting to grow. see... You need to see the growth. Right. One, one point that Eric Winalda made that I think is really interesting is when talking about promotion and relegation, he wasn't even talking about the promotion necessarily. He was saying that, first of all, I would bring in a ton of money because, as he pointed out, the games that have the most viewers in England are the relegation battle games yes. where they are fighting for relegation. And also, for the, on the promotion side in the championship... It's the, the, the tournament to the mini tournament to get you into the Premier League. It's that playoff. Right. All of a sudden MLS would have a true playoff. Mm -hmm. But then they're like, Oh, but we already have playoffs. Yeah, but your playoff system is weird and it just doesn't make sense. Right. Um, and so when all this point is that the amount of money from T V that they would make based on the promotion battle and the relegation battle would make the league so much money. And it would just make all of a sudden everyone likes more money. That was his big point. He was like, "Look, you guys want more money into the into the league? This is an easy way that solves a million problems and gives us more money." Right. Because think about it. You're you're Seattle Sounders. You have one of the best fan bases in the MLS, and all of a sudden, you you're about to go down. Your entire like your entire stadium is gonna fill up. Imagine a relegation game between Atlanta United and Seattle. Right. You know what I mean? Think of how crazy the fans would be going Absolutely. to fight for survival. True. That's yeah. I mean, anyone that's watched a, a relegation game, Premier League game, because uh, now the U.S. has a lot of access to that, you'll see that the, the energy levels are unmatched. They are uh, as season. close they are, they are as close to the, pl the the team's winning, if not more so. Yeah. What team was it last year? Um, I remember watching the game, and then at the end of the game, they panned to a poor old man who was, like, crying because his team was just relegated. Was it Sunderland? 
It was just relegated last sure. year. I can't even remember the teams. I'm not sure. Forgive year, but. me, but I remember seeing yeah, it. Just I like mean, wow, it means a lot. It means so much to the fans over there. Why not bring it over yeah. here? Like why? And not? it's in a, and it's such a com- competitive community that we have here in the U.S. I think that people just haven't experienced it yet. No, they're just scared of what it what it brings. They're but they haven't experienced it, right? Yeah. So, I think that we are all on board with promotion relegation, and we kind of have the same same opinions on it. Oh, so. sorry. Before we move on, I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, just wanted to point out that in the U.S., contrary to popular belief, we actually already have promotion relegation in the UPSL. They recently implemented it, but it's already part of the U.S. soccer pyramid on a very lower level. Yeah, It's relatively new, and so it'll be good to see how it plays out on the lower levels because if it works out at the lower levels, eventually it'll just create a fervor for it that it might reach the MLS. We'll include the link in the show notes, but we have to get on to the next topic. And right. It's a good article by 442 about how there already is promotion relegation, but we'll move on from there. Right. So the next topic, we're going to be talking about another very, very, very big topic that ties into what Yadlik was talking about in one of the main um, quick bits, pay-to-play and U.S. youth development. So for anyone that's ever played as a youth um, player in the United States, you'll know that uh, you'll know a few things. One, college coaches don't look at you if you're playing high school soccer. <laughs> Two, you only get looked at if you're playing an academy or some type of club team. The problem with that is that club teams are expensive. I remember playing, and uh, I think the first year I played was 1500 just for the referee fees and p- paying the club. And then it was uh, 175 for jerseys and all the, the, full, the full kit and all that stuff. So why is that an issue? Well, that segregates a lot of people and a lot of people that love this sport whether we like it or not come from lower income situations and two thousand dollars three thousand dollars is not something that they have readily available to play to pay a club to be able to play the sport that they love so this has been an issue and that's why Yedlin talks about it hope solo talks about it that it causes this inequality this pay to play system doesn't make sense when you're trying to find the best talent out there right and it, like we were, like Yedlin said a little bit, it, it alienates players. You know, there's so many stories in professional soccer of players being discovered because they were playing pickup, or they were. Uh, there's a really famous story. I think it's Nicholas Anelka or Solomon Kalou. I cannot remember which one of the two of them. They were playing in France. They were just playing pickup soccer, and they were 22 years old, pa- way past the age of, yeah. of getting onto a team, playing pickup soccer, and someone discovered them, and that led to their journey into you know, now stardom of being right. a soccer player. Yeah. And I think that it's incredibly interesting to me that we we have such a big country. There are so many people living in this country, so many people playing this game, but it seems like the net of people that we're catching is so small in comparison. We have such a big population playing this sport, yet we're not we're not uh, we're not sifting through everybody. We're just picking a small corner of people who have the most money just to to you know who which one of the best rich kids can we get you know and that's not okay because you have a lot of people who i'm not saying that some of the kids who have money are bad i'm just saying that fair opportunity for everybody we have to cast a bigger net to catch more players i 100 percent agree with this based upon the fact that when i was a kid all i ever played was town team all i ever played was travel town team now we won a state championship we were mad good but no one ever looked at us yeah. because we didn't play on a club team. Right. I didn't know much about club teams. Right. And even the club teams I did know about, my parents weren't going to shell out money yeah. because they didn't believe that that was going to take me to the next right. level. And I think that with all the kids that play, I mean, you go to a tryout, I remember back in the day, like 300 kids trying out yeah. for like six or seven different teams in yeah. one age group. And it's just like impossible to even look at them all i guess right but if we took more time to visit these local places or even hotbeds for soccer that don't necessarily have a lot of club teams uh i think it's uh, imperative that we need to look at these kids and give them a better opportunity and i think that there's just this youth culture of just winning yeah and not developing Right. That's 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 a good point because it actually transitions into something that I found a, an article for socceramerica.com. They actually spoke to Eric Sippel, who's a hedge fund investor. He's actually really heavily involved with youth soccer in California, and he was describing sort of some of the reasons why 
the price of soccer has gone up so much at the club level, academy level. And a big issue is actually related to coaching and coaching licenses. So it's becoming harder and harder to get these level A and B coaching licenses where a lot of the tryouts for to becoming a coach is having people that what they do is they actually play soccer for an entire week where this actually segregates the older people who can't afford to play a whole week's worth of soccer versus these younger guys. So what, what that causes is an ability, you lose a lot of the people that actually know how to teach the sport versus that act, that have just played the sport and are getting into it, right? So you lose a lot of the teachers and that causes an issue of then those these, these guys that get their A and B license, these younger guys that, I mean, you can't really knock them. They might really know a lot of things, but they go into these clubs that are now having to employ these coaches full-time salaries. You can't really consider them volunteers anymore. And then these guys are employees that are being judged based off of not what they are producing in terms of players and talent, but they're being judged in terms of what they're producing in the win column. Right. So that that kills the the entire idea of youth development because then you're just putting out a team of athletes. You're not putting out a team of guys that can kick a ball well, but maybe they're not big enough. Maybe they're not strong enough to to get past their man just yet. Because when you're young, you, the, you're just the difference kid. between Everybody. everyone is ridiculous. Right. And I think it's important to note that one of the most successful clubs in the world at producing young talent, um, Ajax from the Netherlands, one of their coaches for their youth academy, Ronald de Jong, he says he never looks at results. What they look at is they, they don't look at player scoring. They don't look at players how well they defend. They look at minor techniques, minor little things that can say, oh, this player is amazing. They, they, they would never let, so you could lose an entire season, and you'll see that some of the best clubs in England, Chelsea, Manchester United, Barcelona, they, sure, they beat a lot of, of teams, but they lose a lot of games too, and they, some of the youth academies go years and years and years without, without getting a, a youth trophy, but they produce players that go on to play for if they don't play for the their club, they'll go on and play for lower league teams and play still play professionally, but not at this highest level, whatever it may be. But they're looking at technique and what the player does mentally before they're doing what they're doing physically. Right. I think that they are... There was a really interesting quote by Cal Martino who said, kids are not having fun at the youth level. We're treating our 12-year-olds like World Cup winners. Right. And we shouldn't... And I 100% agree. I think that it has to... And Ronaldo also said that for him, he wouldn't call, if you're teaching U10, you shouldn't be called a coach. You should just be called a mentor. Like, that should be your actual title. Because anything before U10, U12, you shouldn't be keeping score. You shouldn't even be talking about, you know, wins and losses. Unfortunately, there's a system that's rewarding the coaching based on wins and losses versus development. And I think that's mostly because our system is very fragmented and, you know, sometimes a club can exist for several years and all of a sudden just fold because it's so unheard. It's very Mm -hmm. fragmented. But you know what I found out doing research for this article? There's a federation rule by the USSF that splits up best friends from playing on the same team. (laughs) Really? Yeah. (laughs) Wow. How insane is that? Think about that for a second. There's like, hey, you play really well together, you guys can't play together anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Literally. I, and it makes no sense. How? how and yeah, what's the... Did you, did it say the reason behind that? It just doesn't... Basically, make... it's just one of those weird little rules to try and get the most productive yeah. youth player. Because they're like, well, if you're with your <laughs> best friend, you're not going to be productive. But you have yeah. to realize that as a kid, you are you want to play because it's fun. Mm-hmm. Plus, that's how you foster some of the best talent. You're just fooling around. I'm trying to make the shit out of you every time we're in practice. Yeah. Like that, cr- that creates creativity. That creates fun. For sure. So, And I've coached at the youth level, not soccer, but I've coached lacrosse at the youth level. And even then, it's like the people you can coach with, it's like dads. And, and all the dads want to do is yeah. win. And they don't care how they're going to win. They're living they're through like, their children's They're lives. living through their children's eyes. And they, they put the players they want to put in. And it's like, you guys are under 10 years old. <laughs> what is the point of winning? Yeah. Like, I don't even keep scores when I was the coach. It was just like, yeah. are you guys having fun? Are you guys right. loving the game? But I believe that there's just this culture of winning and dominance. And if you're the best player and score the best goals and you get the most time, you're going to be the best. And the kids who right. don't get the time, but the problem is, fold. But the problem is is that if you're, if you're 10, 
maybe you're fast now and maybe you're you're scoring goals now, but your body's going to change right. so much in the next eight years. You have to cement the, the actual techniques. You have to cement things. the techniques before, prior to any of the results. Mm-hmm. And one thing, sorry to jump back, but uh, in an interview, Eric Ronaldo was talking about how the number of kids playing soccer is down 9%, which is, that's a lot. Yeah. And it's kind of attributing to all of these little factors, kids not being able to, not having fun anymore because it's, and pay to play, kids not having fun, and this weird ass backwards rule that you can't play with your best friend, right. which makes no sense to me. I think the perfect example of the issue here versus abroad is that abroad you'll see players will train five times a week, play one game on a weekend. Here you train three times a week and have six games in a two day span. Right, because they have these like weekend tournaments. Every every single Every single weekend is just a tournament of yep. some sort. And you're playing three, four, five games. How burning these kids out instead of developing right, and it's just about the wins. Oh, did we win this tournament? Did we win this weekend? It means, like, what, what the hell is the point of that? And you're paying your coach. Okay, sure, he's getting paid for two training, like, two training sessions a week along with the weekend games, but pay him to be training all week. Right? Yeah. Practice five days a week. I, I, this is the kind of sport that if you're into it, you should be into it at a certain age, of course. If you're U14 and you're not playing five days a week, what are you doing? You know? Yeah, and if you're not trying to get better, what are you doing? Right. right. Yeah, I think we have strong opinions on that. and I, I hope, I, I think for the long run of U.S. soccer, U.S. development is something that has to be reconsidered significantly. Oh, yeah. Because right now it's, it's not where it needs to be. And for the, for the country that we mm-hmm. are and the resources that we have as a nation, it's embarrassing that we are where we are and we haven't been able to mold our system to look at systems around the world that actually work. So hopefully that changes in the near future. Whoever the, the president is that comes in uh, makes that one of his top priorities. So third point today that we want to cover, women's national team and kind of women's equality, NWSL, being equal with MLS. There's a big gap between men and women's uh, yep. professional sports. I mean, in terms, let's if we look at just U.S. national team level, A, women's team significantly better has achieved a million times more than the U.S. national than the men's national team. They get paid fractions. They get paid literal fractions. For this is a the U.S. men's national team who has never won anything of true significance. Okay, excuse me for not cl- counting in the Gold Cup, which we play against <laughs> Mexico every year. I'm not counting that. We've never won anything of of Nash of international significance, and yet those players they get paid from the federation. From the Federation, don't forget where the money's coming from. From the Federation, the U.S. men's team is getting paid more than the the U.S. women's national team, which is also getting paid by the same Federation. So a lot of people get lost in this conversation because they start thinking like, oh, but the men's league has more people watching. This has nothing to do with the leagues. Right. This has to do with the national team, where the money comes from the same location, right. and it's the same people dishing out the money. You have to think of this as a business. If this were Google, say Google... Or the, the main company, and that is the U.S. Um, Soccer Federation. And then you had a software engineering division, that which was the women's team. And then you had another division, say, for HR, that was the men's team. The women's team is developing all of the... No, it would be the same thing if you had two, two developer teams. Yeah, two developer teams, and one was men and one was female. But yeah. I'm saying in terms of revenue for the company. Sure. Yeah, okay. <laughs> men and women's. And then the women's team is just getting paid 1% of what the men's team is. Except and then they're producing... Like, oh, but but the women are producing the three best killer right, apps. Right, and, and they're doing all the things that are actually making Google the money. That's what you have to think of it, and people are just like, no, yeah. it's okay, because and the men's MLS league gets more viewers, but that has nothing to do with it. But the women do sell out stadiums. They oh, yeah, pack well, stadiums oh. when they play. Because... They are better than the men. I find it ridiculous that in America we don't give the, the U.S. women's national team credit. And Eric Ronaldo says the same thing. He goes, let me see if I can find the quote here. It's, nobody has represented us better than our women. They deserve a better deal and are going to get it if he's elected. I mean, the, the U.S. has been the front runner for women's soccer in terms of globally. They're, kind of, they're, the, they're the face. They're the face of women's Before soccer. Before women's soccer had a league in the U.S., we won a World Cup. As they're, they are the Brazil of women's soccer. Oh, yeah. They have three <laughs> yeah, World Cups, more than any other team. So to think that the women shouldn't be getting paid. And what I think is more ridiculous is that these women are so successful and they still have to 
they're still treated not only financially worse than the men, but just in terms of requests, right? The women had to play on turf fields, with in which Canada. no soccer player ever wants to fucking play on because it just destroys your leg. You can't go in for a tackle without oh, Who was out. it who posted the Instagram? Up. Who was it on? Was who Cindy posted on Instagram? Sydney Larue. She posted on Instagram of her legs being completely like cut open, ripped open during the World Cup. Like uh, it was the warm ups to the World Cup in 2015. They were doing their uh, like the warm up games and everything, and she posted a picture of her legs just completely beat to shit because of the turf. Right. And so to put this into perspective, when we're speaking about the NWSL, which is the Women's Professional League, versus the MLS, that's where things get a little bit trickier. Because then you can start putting things into play of like, well, it's not generating as much money or it's not doing X, Y, and Z. That is okay to understand because the MLS has such a, has a lot of fans. And so maybe the pay will need to eventually be equal. Yes, I agree it has to be equal. But it's also a business. Right. In terms of the league just, level, I think it needs yeah. to be something that the league actually has to be sustainable. And so Steve Gans, he actually sees this. He sees this as something as that the USSF needs to jump into. Um he thinks that, okay, the, the Federation has a lot of money from the A&E um, contract and a lot of, they have a lot of reserved money that he th- believes can be put into the Women's League, at least to get it kick-started, right? And yeah. to make sure that it's at least financial. Think of it like as, Basic, a, as a booster pack. Yeah, or um, like a financial injection, right. which a lot of companies get. A right, abs- well. absolutely. So what do you guys think of that? Do you think that that's something that the Federation should do for the Women's League or no? So I'm going to... B, I'll let you answer first because I want to. I have an interesting idea. I think that until we get this ridiculous systemic inequality that women face in just every aspect of the United mm-hmm. States life, life yeah. um, I don't think it's going to change very. If they much. were to inject money. If they were to inject money, I think that it would definitely get some people on board and i mean they would have more marketing they would be able to to branch out maybe even hire some more talent scouts and this and that and but i just you don't think it's the long-term solution i don't think it's a long-term solution i I believe that i mean even this capitalistic society we like we reward the people who are the best women's are the best yeah why aren't they being paid the best it's yeah it seems like a more of a cultural issue but i think the injection is a step in the right direction yeah it just needs to be put into the right, in, in right, the right hands. The right hands exactly. The right so a couple of things. The interesting part about the NWSL is that the U.S. the United States Soccer Federation actually has part ownership of the NWSL, which is different than they have with the MLS. Because the MLS is owned by the league. The league is kind of its own entity. And the USSF has v- almost very little real say in the MLS. Like, yeah, they... they they're there, mm-hmm. but the, the presence of the USSF in the NWSL is actually a lot bigger than it is in the MLS, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, oh, okay. And so that's point one. But that's where Steve Gans is saying that they should inject the money because they have the ability to do that. It's, mm-hmm. it's you know, that kind of thing. Now, I think that, yes, they should inject the money in two key areas. One, I think they should do it in a, in a way to stabilize the league. Which they've actually been doing a decent job. Aside from, from Boston Breakers folding and them moving two of their franchises over the past couple of years, for the most part, they haven't rapidly expanded. They're still they're at nine teams now, now that the Breakers folded. And so they're trying to make sure that everything is sustainable. They finally have a TV contract, which before the NWSL, the last league prior to the NWSL, didn't have a real contract. Yeah. Um, and so I think that one way of injecting some money to stabilize the league, great. I wouldn't say take all the resources and do that. One idea that I 100% agree with is, um, where is it? Oh, either way, it was one of the it was one of the candidates. I believe it was either Kyle Martino or Eric Winalda saying that we have to create. I think it was Eric Winalda actually. We have to create stars. We should be taking money and pouring it into marketing for the NWSL, or I'm sorry, the USSF should be taking some of this money and injecting it into straight up marketing. Think of how popular the NBA is. Because of LeBron James. Right. It's one of the... It, it, the NBA is a star-driven league. And you hear it being said all over ESPN. You hear it being said all over the internet. The fact that you have these marketable athletes that become the face of this league, which makes it so, so popular. Think of how many people love LeBron James. Think of how many people love Kyrie Irving. Think of how many people love James Harden. That is what drives the NBA. It's this, it's this cult following of these stars and so, same thing happens in global soccer. I we gave you the, we talked about how Neymar more than doubled PSG's shirt sales. Neymar is a force to be reckoned with, 
And in all honesty, Alex Morgan is a force to be reckoned with in terms of marketing. But the NWSL, they are doing some things with it, but they should be out on every single street corner with marketing left and right. And they should just be putting out their stars and just create stories. And I'm not just saying that just for Alex Morgan and Sidney LaRue and Marta and all these other famous, famous players who are playing in the league. But I'm talking about even the every like every other player on these teams tell their story get the marketing dollars behind it because people will start to feel invested a lot of people want to invest in people in terms of like emotional investment Mm -hmm. versus a team at first right they said they need to build a community around these players especially if your team doesn't have one of the superstars you need to be able to still have something that you're backing you should still have a star every team has a star even if it's not a superstar right it's not not every team has an alex morgan but you have you, you need to be able to push your players and and I almost have. I don't think I've ever seen a commercial for for the women's league. I've never seen anything. Gatorade commercials, maybe. I don't or know. maybe I don't know. Like some well, commercials. promoting the league. No, I'm saying, promoting the league. Nothing. I just mean, promoting other brands not and on stuff. Facebook, TV. The anything. only time I've ever seen it was during one of the women's national team games on Fox Sports, and it was in between halves. They were uh, talking about it, but that's it. That's the only time I've ever seen it. Yeah. And I believe that with. This um, injection of money creating these stars, the stars themselves or even the people who play in the league are going to be that much more invested right. with the fact that, oh, hey, they're like investing See, money into right. showing what I'm about. Like Now I am going to invest my time and my efforts right. to make this a better place and to, to kind of go all in. Right. It. It's more of a... Uh circle of life type of thing we're like exactly. oh, okay i'm getting i'm getting pushed and i'm seeing that there's a lot of love behind me well let me now engage more with my community let me go out let me meet the fans let me do this let me do that and that's how you cultivate right the following that you need for the league to grow you get that snowball effect exactly right. so you invest in this player you're putting them in the spotlight all of a sudden they're going to grow their following on instagram social like all their social media platforms are going to blow up and in, then in return, that's just going to help the league make more money and make the players make more money. You read about how a lot of players, they're professionals, but they still have a secondary job. Oh, yeah. How are you considered a professional if you have a second job? Right. That yeah. doesn't make sense. Yeah, it's probably a handful of players, even on the women's national team, that can actually claim that they are professional soccer very, players. Very they few live of off them. of just their advertisement and soccer related yeah. things. Well, so. Very few of them in the league. I think the, the national team, there's probably just a couple who yeah, don't get paid that much money. Yeah, but still, like, you, you should, whole, the whole team whole should not have to. Everyone should, there shouldn't be anyone there that's worried about money because they... Oh, yeah. Because and I also feel that when something big happens in women's soccer, that's when they put the money into it. It's like, yeah. oh, the women are going to go temporary. here. Like, let's put all the ads on and everything like yeah. that. But now when the women aren't doing anything much, right. like, let's just, let's just forget It seems like that. they forget that the league exists. It seems like they put a lot of their focus on the U.S. the U.S. women's national team. But you got to make sure the league is cultivated and it's followed. And, and, and yeah, I think that I could... We could just be beating a dead horse here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think all of the all the candidates agree that this is a, a, a big priority, right? It, it, equality amongst men and women is something that I don't think any candidate would speak against, really. Of course but all of them have, have plans <clears throat> for, for tackling this issue. So moving on to the final, final topic for today, transparency in the role of the, the USSF president. So right now, currently, let's just say it isn't transparent. No. It, there isn't a lot of information out there on what the president does what the or what the federation spends their money on how they spend their money how it's divided what are the teams that do this what blah 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 so that's a big topic because people are saying well if you get a new president in there and there isn't any transparency what's really the, the, difference? What's the difference what are we seeing so a lot of the candidates solo winograd have platforms that specifically try to say hey we are going to get in we're going to make subdivisions of the federation that are going to tackle marketing that are going to do this they're going to get this amount of money and people are really enjoying that concept because right now even today i think um nassel tweeted a document saying that they have reached out to, to ussf try to get them to release documents financial documents to say hey people are asking for this can you just make it visible can you make it s- can you put it out there so people know how you're spending their money? And the Federation has turned down that request. So you have all these different organizations that fall with, uh, within the, the soccer umbrella in the United States that are asking for this as well, and they're still not, they're still not giving the people what they want. Right. Uh, one thing that's really interesting is that the USSF is facing several lawsuits. So 
You mentioned Nassau. Nassau has filed the lawsuit against them. It's been an ongoing thing for about a year now, or close to a year. Uh, U.S. Soccer removed Nassau's second division status and gave it to the USL, which is very close relation to the MLS, which is behind this shroud of secrecy that goes on with the USSF. Nassau finds it very disturbing that because they weren't part of this elitist crew, they weren't aligned with MLS, they weren't aligned with, with this idea that they had, they were alienated. And now US, the U.S. soccer is trying to completely stamp out Nassau. I know it, 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 people can say, oh, but all they did was just say, no, they're not a Division II league. It doesn't matter. They're trying to actively get rid of Nassau so that USL is the only Division II league. League. They're trying so to discredit them at any point they that. can, and so they, Nassau has sued USS, the United States Soccer Federation, and so hopes it will actually file a, a legal complaint, which is like one step before a lawsuit. It's a legal complaint that the USSF is in violation of the Ted Stevens Olympic and Amateur Sports Act. And it states in her complaint that because of the power, prestige, status, and money flowing from the Federation's alliance with Major League Soccer and Soccer United Marketing, the USSF's priority has become protecting and building the MLS at the expense of our youth, the women's game, and our place in the global game. Which kind of wraps up a lot of what we were uh, talking about before, the past three points, that because of this shroud of secrecy, because of, of USSF's alignment with MLS, and um, Soccer United Marketing is basically... It is MLS and USSF's marketing arm. It's a company that's kind of separate, but it runs as the marketing. Which Kathy for Carter the, is the seat. Well, she steps down, quote unquote, during her present there in her candidate run. Yes, <laughs> but it's there basically. It's like think of it as like their marketing. They're outsourcing their marketing to this company, but this company is technically internal. It's right. this big thing, but basically they're facing all these lawsuits. A lot of it based on secrecy and lack of transparency because. No one knows what's going on. And it's just sketchy. Things are just sketchy. They don't know where the money's being spent. They don't know what's going on. It's just right. a big, sketchy mess. And even in terms of that, be before you get to your point, sorry, um, I saw another our, uh, another tweet this morning that showed a bunch of US old former USL players actually put out a document that they signed and said, hey, guys, we know you're going to lose money and sponsorships if you don't vote for Kathy Carter, but please make sure that you're putting your professional integrity ahead of this voting scandal Wait, and, and make sure that you don't vote for her. Yeah, I'll pull it up. Then I'll, I'll make sure to include crazy. that in, in the um, the show notes as well. I'll, I'll show you right That's now. That's insane to me. But that, that goes to show you, like, you have this already sketchy voting system where you're all of a sudden, it's supposed to be anonymous, and but if Kathy Carter doesn't win, all of a sudden all these players lose their... Huh. Their financial backing. That's right? ridiculous. So, um, comparatively, it is kind of somewhat similar, but um, in Africa, certain countries hold um, pageants for like the um, the governing bodies, and it's a pretty much a pageant for who is the least corrupt leader, and that just goes to show in Africa, like transparency is so hard for some of these countries that. They're doing pageants to be like, hey, who's the nicest one out of all wow. of us? And I think that can be seen here, too. Like, it, there's there's little to no transparency. There's going to be little to no faith within your industry. Right. So I'll actually read this document, a little um, excerpt from this document that was signed by a handful of former USL and NASA players and organizations that are trying to create equality um, within the USSF um, umbrella. So here we go. We know many of the members of... The Athlete Council risk losing sponsorship or endorsement opportunities if they don't vote in a block for Kathy Carter. MLS has chosen a successor to Sunil Gulati. However, we need you to be courageous and do what is best for the players you represent by voting as individuals. So that's all, that, That's such a sketchy thing because it's like, hey, do this or or you'll lose all your sponsorships. But that shouldn't be that well, shouldn't be the, the case. From right? my understanding, it's basically. Everyone has been behind closed doors, been told, hey, vote for Kathy Carter because if you don't, you're going to lose your sponsorship. This letter is basically being like, guys, we know <laughs> they came and threatened you like some sketchy 1930s gangster, <laughs> but we need to be courageous and be like, we have to vote for who is best for us, who we think is best. 
And it's just such a sketchy process that, you know, Kathy Carter was handpicked by uh, both Sunil Gulati and Don Garber, who, despite the fact that they've distanced themselves from her, she has said that they have publicly, or not publicly, she has said that they are endorsing her, but they denied it. But then there was a secret uh, dinner party that happened in Manhattan where they came out and presented her and said, guys, this is our candidate. And this is Sunil Gulati and Don Garber, the commissioner of the MLS. And my whole situation is Don Garber's role in the whole thing should be solely to MLS. It shouldn't be to, like, influence this kind of right. thing. And so I find that fascinating that someone put a letter out like that. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it shows that there things it sh- it's a perfect example of these things are not transparent. Right. right? You're, you're having to almost put this last-ditch call. Today's Friday. The, the, the vote happens Sunday. Tomorrow. 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 It's this last-ditch effort to be like, guys, please make sure that you're putting your heart and you're putting your conscience behind your vote and you're not doing something just because you don't want to really shake up the, the federation. So we'll include a video, too, if you're curious about how the voting will, will go down, um, just because it's very confusing you're to You're not explain. good at math. You're... Gonna You're not going to get it, but you can watch the video and be con- as confused as we are. Yeah, because it's not a public election. Like I, we can't vote. You know, let's it's just say there's a lot of weights and a lot of waiting that goes on based yeah. of based off of random numbers. That makes zero sense. Yeah. Uh, one thing I want to wrap up this topic with: Kathy Carter is a robot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is something that happened fairly recently. They got a bunch of candidates in a room together. And they inform them that the role of the president of the United States Soccer Federation is shifting. This was the whoever it was from the USSF and Don Garber, whoever it was, they came together and said that the president of the United States Soccer Federation isn't going to just be a president. They're basically going to be the chairperson on a board of directors, mm. which if you know, it means that they have almost little, they don't have any power anymore yeah. necessarily. It's going to lie in the hands of a board of directors, and they're basically just going to be the leader of this board of directors. Mm-hmm. Which, for some people, it works, but for a lot of the for the, a lot of the uh, candidates, it's like this happened a month ago. So yeah. it's like they've been running for six, seven months, understanding that like okay, one way, and then I'm running to be the president. I'm going to be able to do X, Y, and Z once I get in there. And all of a sudden, a month before the actual election, they're like, oh, hey guys, just kidding. We're, your role isn't going to be what we told right. you what it would be six months ago. So you're now running on this new idea. Right. Good luck. Oh, yeah, and a lot of the old heads that are a part of this board are going to make sure that things are running just the way they want it. Which is ridiculous. So yeah. you, you talk about change and you talk about all these things and then you fi- come to find out that in reality they really don't want it to change. Right. It's kind of messed up. Yeah. It's because, like I said, it's the elitist group kind of thing. It's a small group of people who th- thinking they can control soccer – in America for everybody, right. which is absolutely ridiculous. Right. Seems to be the status uh, quo for much of everything that goes on a lately. Lot of, a lot of government entities or people right. that try to represent a large number of yeah. people in, the, in, the, in a demographic. But And I'm like, I'm not naive enough to, to think like, oh, like, it, it, you know, it shouldn't be like this because, you know, whatever. But it's politics. I get it. But it's hard to sit by and watch when, when you see that there's so much potential and you see that our kids are suffering, the women's game is suffering. You, you look at it and go, we need to change this. Right. And, and then uh, it also makes all of these topics that we discovered today kind of meaningless because if one person that was allegedly going to take, char- take charge of, of the Federation doesn't actually have the power to instill any of his visions, then... What's the point of being called a president if you right. can't actually start putting things into action? Yeah, and then that just creates this, well, this guy's the president, but he hasn't done anything. Yeah. Why hasn't yeah. he done anything? Become, he told us he was going to do all this stuff. It's like, well, he was running one way, but now, now he <laughs> now can't really do well, much, they, so they he's the president. Job, but they, they changed the job description yeah. you know, three weeks before <laughs> Halfway office, through. so... Yeah. Huh. Sorry. Uh... Yeah, that's uh Yeah, I think wraps up we've there. exhausted our our opinions and and top and ideas for for these topics. Again, we um are recording this before the pod before the election happens. Obviously, you've heard us kind of indicate that. So, we hope that by the time by the time this comes out, this all that they'll have been elected and we hope that this kind of enlightened you and the person that you were hoping would win won if they are good and Do you guys have any quick um uh who do you want to win? Who's, who's your top pick? Oh, I don't know. I don't know if I want to get too political. I mean, I think that despite the fact that neither Eric Bonalda or Kyle Martino have ever really, like, 
had a lot of business experience. I think both of them... Th- what I see as an, as an issue with Kathy Carter is that I feel like she's disconnected from the real world. Mm-hmm. I feel like she is, is very much into that ussf like mentality and she's right, well, an she's, old head like and we said in the beginning she's the most connected so she her her answers to almost all the topics are the what you expect yeah the standard quo the sidestepping of answers yeah but i think that because cal martino and Eric Winalda have both played on the u.s men's national team and they have been commentators and they've you know they got to experience the game in so many different facets they know what it could be like and i think they have vision um and so i hope one of them win this I just I want to see change. Mm-hmm. I don't necessarily. Yeah. I agree. I think that what I, what excites me about both Eric Winalda and Kyle Martino, and even Hope Solo, I, I don't think that she's a front runner. Nor do I. What I like about those three is one of the the first things that they'll tell you needs to change in the country is culture, and that's what I think is what is most important to us in general. And I think that that is that is the number one that uh, these these four points kind of they all play together into changing the culture, but they've realized that the culture is the most important thing that needs to change and they're willing to tackle that where it seems like a lot of the other more business oriented people don't really have that vision because they don't have the experience of it so they don't understand what it is that makes soccer such an amazing sport so i hope that i, I honestly hope that one of those three probably either eric Ronaldo or, or Kyle martino honestly but I, I hope they do because they they do have a vision for the sport that i think correlates with what a lot of the world sees the sport as I'm with you on that one. Either one of the two, Eric Ronaldo or Kyle Martino, yeah. because they're they were so close to the game and they're like so on yeah. the forefront of this uh, right. that well, they would hopefully make some. But I'll say whoever does win, I it, it's again one of those things where I don't want them to fail because I I do exactly. want to make sure that <laughs> the the sport does grow. So whoever does does eventually take charge, I do I do hope that they they do take all of this into consideration and and do their best to to really grow the sport. Yeah, well said. I think well, we hope to see, you know, like we said, when this comes out on Monday, it'll already be announced who won. So hopefully they take these, these issues into consideration and we can go from here. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, go U.S. soccer. As always, guys, thank you so much for listening. We love to talk about soccer. We love to talk about culture. We love to talk to you. We love listening to what you have to say. So be sure to like, subscribe, comment, review, and download our podcast. We had some great topics today. USSF, presidential candidates. Tomorrow's the big day. Hopefully, we like to see some change in USSF. And uh, thank you so much for listening. And we hope to see you guys back next week.